and prayer requests before you. And Lord, we pray that right now that you would accept our thanks and our gratitude. Lord, we worship you and we're gra just grateful and we praise you for answered prayers, those that have been mentioned tonight. And Lord, we're uh, grateful that you've uh, taken concern and care for those that uh, have given testimonies tonight that you have worked in their lives. And Lord, uh, you've heard every one of those mentioned, and Lord, every one of them were grateful. And Lord, for the requests that have been made, uh, you know the needs in each situation for the health and for the safety and for the the uh, the be uh, bereavement, Lord, and all of those needs that uh, have a spiritual angle. Lord, uh, I pray that you'd work in each one of those hearts for the ones who need to be saved, that you'd save them, the ones who ought to be in church, Lord, that are not. I pray that you'd lead them. And Lord, I pray that you'd just bless uh, Brother and Mrs. Place as they travel and the Coxes as they travel and Lord, give safety to them. We pray that you'd bless in this service tonight. Lord, I, I thank you for the people who belong to this church family. And Lord, that they care enough to come together on Wednesday night and to pray. And Lord, our hearts are being lifted up together right now to you. And Lord, we ask you to meet these needs. And Lord, we ask that you'd bless this uh, church service. And Lord, bless the teaching and the singing and all that's done tonight. Lord, give us a, a heart for evangelism and give us a, a fervency, a love for one another that just is kindled and fervent. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to love each other with an undying love. Lord, help us to love you like we should and to obey you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Be seated, please. Now we're gonna, we've got a men's group, don't we, that's going to sing? The men's going to sing. Come ahead, fellas. And then we'll have a message for you. Open door, and I can't feel at home in this. 
this world anymore. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world I mean, different group. Right? You got the boys there on the front. It was teenagers. And Brother Aaron, it's in his twenties. Brother Denny in his thirties. Brother Jimmy in his forties. <laughs> you guys can give me twenty dollars a piece after church is over. <laughs> uh, it was good singing. I like that. Stirs up the soul, doesn't it? Amen. Well, open your Bibles to Second Timothy chapter number two been in a series on soul winning evangelism evangelism is the good telling the good news about Jesus Christ and how to be saved and and there there is there are guidelines in the scripture that tell us how to go about telling folks how to be saved and uh, you know it's uh, it's God's plan that he chose us instead of angels to tell people how to be saved and he gave us the manual we have the owner's manual, the instruction manual, the Bible tells us how to go about it. And uh, that's what we're studying tonight. The Bible is our authority. It doesn't matter what Aunt Susie said or Uncle Johnny said, it's what the Bible says is what counts. Isn't that right? And uh, if everybody agrees with the Bible, then we'll all be in good shape. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, we'll begin to read. And we'll read through verse 26. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes the word gender there has the meaning of stirring up or uh, causing something to spark and, and to come into being to, that is gender strifes and strifes would be turmoil and arguments and fussing uh, debate and he says that knowing that they do gender strifes and the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So in, in essence, what the scripture is saying right there is that Paul's writing to young Timothy and he's telling this young preacher how to go about speaking to people about the good news, the gospel that tells people how to be saved. And he says, first of all, to avoid foolish and unlearned questions. In other words, don't get bogged down in a debate about whether Adam had a belly button or not or, uh, or how many stars there are in the sky. Or, uh, you know, we could go on and on. He says, avoid foolish and unlearned questions. And he says the servant of the Lord is not supposed to be one that goes out and beats people over the head with the word of God but he's supposed to be gentle and kind and sweet and take the word of God and show people how to become a brother or a sister in the Lord and uh, then he says he tells us how to go about it and that's by being a teacher who is patient and meek and one who instructs and then he says if we do that then it's up to God to do the saving when, when we tell people how and we go about it in the right way then it may be that God will save them. It's still God is the one who does the saving, right? No matter how uh, polished we may be, no matter how much we know about the scriptures, no matter how smart we are, uh, it's just still up to God to do the saving. It's not in us. And uh, so many Christians need to know how to go about presenting the gospel. Let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. And fill us with your spirit. Lord, without the spirit of God, the word of God will not have its power. And uh, Lord, won't accomplish its purpose. So we pray that you'd mix the spirit and the, 
and the power of the word of God together tonight in our hearts that we might be better servants for thee in telling people how to be saved. I pray that you'd bless us. May we love the Lord Jesus enough to do it when we learn how to. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 through 26 <coughs> describes the proper approach and uh, the attitude for soul winning. And, uh, and, and that's what we're going to call this tonight, the attitude in evangelism. The attitude in evangelism. There is uh, a, a frame of mind that we're supposed to have when we go about trying to tell people how to be saved. And uh, many Christians have decided... Uh, in the past that they wanted to win maybe some family member or some friend or co-worker to the Lord and, and so they begin to uh, try to figure out how they're going to witness to this person and so they give it a try and they begin to tell this person that they love how to be saved and in the middle of it they get confused or frustrated or, or they didn't know the answer to a question or they didn't have the right attitude and they just got frustrated and said man I give up and, uh, and decided never to try it again because it was just too embarrassing to try to tell somebody how to get saved and when you're not thinking clearly. Well, <laughs> there, there was a couple of rednecks. Uh, we'll call them Jim Bob and Billy Joe. And they're walking down the road one night and, uh, and a truck comes along and hits old uh, uh, Jim Bob, knocks him off in the ditch. And man, he's hurt bad. Well, Billy Joe gets on his cell phone and calls 911. And the operator says, well, uh, we'll send an ambulance out there, sir. Where, where, where are you? And he said, well, we're on uh, Eucalyptic Street. She said, can you spell that? He said, E-U, 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 C. Oh, he said, I'll just drag him over to Oak Street, pick him up there. <laughs> you know, sometimes as a Christian who's trying to win somebody to the Lord, if we don't know the answer, we just feel like maybe we ought to drag them somewhere else and let somebody else get them saved. And, uh, and you've probably felt that way before. I have. I've been in that situation when I first got saved. I didn't have a clue how to go about it, but I wanted to. I wanted to win somebody to the Lord. But it, I'll leave you with this before we move to the first point. If you can't win somebody to the Lord, at least drag them over to church where they can hear the gospel. Amen. And so so I'm convinced that we need to be able to win them, but we can at least get them to church until we figure out how to do it. Now, we've studied the truths of the gospel for several weeks now about how to present the gospel of the Lord. And tonight we're going to talk about the attitude in evangelism. And it's about the, the pattern of thinking that we use when we're thinking about evangelism. It's a pattern of thinking that we make second nature so that when we witness to somebody, it happens, we get the presentation out, not in a canned way, not like a memorized speech, but we know how we're going to go about it. We've got a road map. We've got a plan of action. And uh, therefore, we won't feel like we've been knocked off in the ditch and going to have to call 911 to get somebody else to get the sinner saved. So we mentioned four points tonight. And uh, they'll be on the screen on the wall. And if you want to mark them down on a piece of paper, I wish you would because there's some scriptures that will be very helpful to you tonight. Four points to consider about the attitude in evangelism. Number one, avoid foolish questions. That's what the scripture said that we read just a little while ago. Foolish questions. You say, well, what are foolish questions? Uh, somebody has said there is no such thing as a foolish question. Well, there are foolish questions. The scripture wouldn't say to avoid them, right? Hello? If there wasn't a, such a thing as foolish questions, the scripture wouldn't say to avoid them. So there are foolish questions. You say, well, what is a foolish question? Well, a foolish question would be, it's a question that's not asked in order to gain the truth, but a foolish question is one that's asked for the purpose of confusing or hiding the truth. That's a foolish question. They're questions that are not looking for an answer, but they're created to stir up doubt and maybe even strife. You say, well, who would ask a question like that? A lot of people would. Uh, look at 2 Timothy 2.23 again. Now, we get our answers from the Bible, right? So here's, here's the answer. In 2.23, he says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Now, we've already said that we don't want to get into arguments and debates when we're trying to tell somebody how to get saved. 
I mean, that's not our purpose, is to argue and show somebody how much we know or how good a debater we are. That's not the purpose. Our purpose is to try to get them to see that they're lost and they need the Lord and how to receive the Lord as Savior. And so he says to avoid foolish and unlearned questions because they're going to end up causing strife. For example, a trained Jehovah's Witness will come to your door and knock on your door and will ask you questions. And they ask you questions not in order, the Jehovah's Witnesses are not asking you questions at your doorstep in order to find out the truth. They've already been trained in their doctrine and they ask you questions that they hope will cause you to be confused and turn to them for what they want to give you for an answer. That's their purpose. That's foolish and unlearned questions. They don't sincerely want an answer. They want to cause you to feel confused. And so they'll ask you questions like uh, about they don't believe in the Trinity. So they'll ask you questions like, well, how could, and they'll say it real nice, but they'll say, well, how could God be three people and yet the Bible says he's one or they'll ask you how can Jesus be God if Jesus prayed to God or they'll ask you how can hell be eternal if the Bible says that death is asleep now, they're, they're headed somewhere with all those questions. They're headed to tell you something that they believe, but it doesn't come out of the Bible. You say, well, they always have a Bible with them. They have something called the New World Translation. The New World Translation is not the Bible. It is one that they have translated against the, against the rules of grammar to make it say what they want it to say. They've wrote their own Bible. And so when they begin to ask you questions, they're trying to get you to doubt the real Bible so they can open their New World Translation of the Scriptures, which is not an accurate translation. Uh, I, I don't believe in using any translation but the King James Bible. I believe it is the Word of God. It is perfect. It is without error. Not one, not one mistake in God's Word. You say, why do you believe that? Because the Bible says so. <laughs> the Bible says that it, that it is the perfect Word of God. It's pure as silver, purified seven times. And, uh, but they made their own Bible in order to teach something different than the actual Bible teaches. They made up their own religion. And so those are what the Bible would refer to as being foolish and unlearned questions. So say, well, how, do you, how would you know then if somebody's asking a sincere question or if they're asking a foolish and unlearned question. Well, here's a test. You with me? Here's a test. If you want to know if a question is really sincere or not, see if they're willing to listen carefully to your answer. If they ask you a foolish and unlearned question, they're not going to care about your answer, really. All they're wanting to do is spout off what they believe. Are you with me? And so if they're not if there's no, there's no profit in a conversation where they don't want to know the answer to the question, the questions they ask are foolish and unlearned questions that's designed to confuse. So what should we do? Well, we should follow Paul's example. Look at Acts uh, chapter 17, verse 32 through 34. Have we got it up here? We do. Look at this. Here's the way Paul handled the foolish and unlearned questions. It says, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Now, Paul's been preaching about the resurrection of Christ. What did some do? Some mocked. Would you say that they would be the kind of people to ask foolish and unlearned questions? <laughs> yeah, they're mockers. They're not looking for real answers. And others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So they're, they're just kind of brushing him off and saying, well, we're not going to decide anything right now. We've heard enough of this for now. We might listen to you again sometime. And then it says, So Paul depart, departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him, and, next word, believed. Among the which was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, 
and others with them. So they really believe. So you, here you've got a mixed group. Some are mocking, some are just walking away, and others really followed him and really believed. And so those who were really interested want to know the answers to questions. Isn't that right? If they really want to know answers to questions, then you take time to explain to them. And then we have to learn how to, dis how to deal with the scorners. Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5. We're not to imitate the way of the fool in dealing with foolish questions. If a fool is trying to confuse and distort and to scorn and to mock, we're not to carry on a long debate with him. So Proverbs 26, verse 4 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Wait, let's stop right there. So he says, if the fool is asking foolish and unlearned questions like he talked about in the beginning here, if he's just asking questions to try to stir up an argument, then don't be like him. If, if you begin to debate and argue back with him, just go in at it, you're not gaining any ground. All you're doing is acting like him, right? So we don't want to act like the fool. But then he goes ahead and says, but answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So what does that mean? Sounds like, almost like a contradiction, doesn't it? But the Bible never contradicts itself, never. So God didn't just write down there in one place, say, don't answer a fool, and then in the very next sentence say, answer a fool. He didn't forget what he said in the first verse and then just repeat the wrong thing. But he's saying, don't be like the fool in answering him, but so he is not lifted up in his pride thinking he got the best of you. You give a brief, a concise short answer to let him know that you know the truth, that you show him the truth in the scripture, and then you stop. You don't debate. You don't argue. You don't have bitter strife back and forth. That's not Christ-like. And so some people are outright, outright heretics and don't want to know anything that challenges their beliefs. So in, in Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, the scripture gives instructions about a heretic. Now what is a heretic? A heretic is someone who, by an act of his own will, believes something false or something that is contradictory to the Scriptures. He believes something contrary, and he's not willing to change. Even when you show him in the Bible, he won't change. Well, he's a heretic if he's unwilling to change, because then it's not a, it's not a matter of the intellect, it's a matter of the will. Are you with me? See, if it's a matter of the intellect, it's just that they don't understand. Now, all of us are ignorant to a certain degree, right? Uh, when I first got saved, I didn't know anything about the Bible. Now, in 30-some-odd years, I've learned a little bit more along the way, learning a little bit more, and I've learned that since I didn't know very much in the beginning and I didn't know a whole lot a few years ago, I probably still don't know a whole lot about the Bible. I'm learning more about it, but I realize that there's a lot I don't know because if anybody knew all of it, they'd be equal to God, and nobody's equal to God. And so we answer the heretic just so he knows that there is an answer, but we don't debate it with him. A good biblical soul winner always comes back to the fundamental points of Scripture. We don't debate unknowns or philosophy, right? We say with the Bible. Number two, we're to point number two. B, now we're looking at an attitude to have when we're trying to win someone to Christ. The second attitude, the second aspect of a soul winner's attitude would be to be gentle, patient, and humble. It's difficult to deal with people who are in the snare of the devil. They often mock the truth, are overbearing, proud, unreasonable, and we're tempted to respond just back to them in the same way. Right? If somebody is, is mean and vicious and mocking the scripture, man, we want to get in their face and tell them what for. Yeah. But that's not the way the Bible tells us to be. We're not supposed to be like they are. We're supposed to be gentle, patient, and humble. The scripture says we're to be kind with them instead of trading punches. You ever see, you ever see somebody getting, two guys get in an argument? One of them says something insulting to the other one? And then the other one says something insulting back. 
husbands and wives could almost do this. <laughs> They're not supposed to do that either, are they? And so they begin trading insults, trading sarcasms, uh, trading, trading lashes with the tongue, but that's not the Christ-like way to be. And that's not the way we want to be when we're trying to win somebody to the Lord. Now look at 2 Timothy back in our text verse again. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. And the servant of the Lord, that's you and me. When, when you're saved, you're supposed to be a servant of the Lord. You're not a servant of self. I'm not to be my own servant. I'm supposed to serve him. What does a servant do? A servant does what his master wants him to do. And so it says, the servant of the Lord must not strive. What does it mean to strive? That means to wrestle and tug and punch and hit and kick and, and be in contention with somebody. We're not to be a servant who strives, but he says, but be gentle unto all men. Gentle? Gentle. That word doesn't need definition, does it? <laughs> I think everybody in this room knows what it means to be gentle. And he says, but to be gentle unto how many men? All men. Even those who are mean and nasty back to us. We're still supposed to be gentle. And he says, apt to teach. What does that mean? That means that we're supposed to be a teacher to them. We're, help, we're going to try to help educate them to the point where they know how to be saved. And patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So if we deal with them in the same manner <coughs> that they deal with us, then we only stir them up to more anger. What does the Bible say in Proverbs 15.1? Proverbs 15.1 says, And a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Grievous words stir up anger. When I first got saved, I wanted to tell my brother how to be saved. My brother is three and a half years older than me, and he already knows everything. He was not saved, but he was older than me, so therefore he knows everything. My brother, my brother, I love my brother, but he's a little bit abrasive. I don't know if he's watching on the internet or not tonight, but if you are, you're a little abrasive, brother. <laughs> if you don't believe it, ask our sister. <laughs> He's a little bit abrasive. I mean, he, he just says what he thinks, and he's an honest man. But sometimes you can be so honest. Everything that we think, we don't have to say, right? And, uh, and so when, when I was first saved, I'd try to tell my brother how to be saved. But he didn't want his little brother knowing something that he didn't know. And so he would, he would, he would get mad and arguing and debating. And so... Uh, the next thing he knew, I knew I was supposed to be kind and gentle and patient, but somehow it started down here and just kind of worked its way up. And I could feel it going up into my face and up into my eyes, and I could feel my ears turning red. And pretty soon I'm right in his face getting back at him. We'd be driving home that night, and my wife would look over at me and she'd say, I bet you're really going to win him to the Lord like that. <laughs> a little sarcastic <laughs> I'd say well I know it I didn't mean to get in an argument with him I didn't mean to debate didn't mean to get loud it's just that he brings out the worst in me <laughs> but guess what I never did win him to the Lord everything I was telling him was true but he didn't want to hear it from me and, uh, and when I got angry back at him it just killed any chance to win him to Christ now he did get saved later on by uh, talking to another preacher. I, I think he got saved at church on a, on a Sunday night. He called me. I was in Bible college in Oklahoma City. And he called me after church one night. He said, I just thought you might want to know, little brother, I got saved tonight. I said, well, hallelujah, great. I'm glad somebody got to you. <laughs> but I was never going to win him being that way. And you can't be mean and nasty and convince somebody to get saved. They're, they're going to be a lot more impressed with your kindness, your gentleness, and your love for them. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not saying you don't agree. You don't agree with people in their error, right? The Apostle Paul didn't do that. He didn't agree with people in their error, but he was kind and gentle. And you can stand your ground without being mean and nasty. And you can stand on the truth and hold to the truth without being hateful and argumentative 
and debating. You can testify about what God's done for you without fighting and yelling. Acts 17, 2. Look at this. And Paul, as his manner was, went in, to, in unto them, and three Sabbath days, what's the next word? You're not reading, are you? <laughs> Reason. Mrs. Crockett, me and Mrs. Crockett, only two in the room reading tonight. No, I'm just, I, you were following. You were contemplative, I know. Now let's read it again. Acts 17, 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, what did he do? Reasoned with them. Out of the scriptures. He reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Now look at Acts 18, 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. And, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Now go to Acts 24, 25. And as he reasoned, of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. See, he was, Paul was talking about judgment to, to, the, to the king here, to the governor. And he's reasoning with him. And he's telling him about judgment, but he's not being mean and nasty. <laughs> and it says, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, Felix didn't convert to Christ but Paul told him the truth and he stood his ground but he did it in a nice kind and gentle way now look at Acts 28 23 now watch how watch, watch, here's a little outline of how to talk to somebody about the Lord watch how Paul did, does this in Acts 28 23 and when they had appointed him a day there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded number one and testified the kingdom of God, number two, persuading them, number three, concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets and from morning till evening. So what did, what did Paul do? How did he go about this? He expounded. What does that mean? He expounded the scripture. It means he would read a verse and tell them what it means. And it says he expounded to them the scriptures and then he testified, he gave testimony himself and then he persuaded them. You see, it's easier to persuade somebody with a tear in your eye. It's easier to persuade somebody if you let them know you love them. It's easier to persuade someone if they see the concern rather than just a mean spirit. Now sometimes people get the idea that some old independent fundamental Baptist preacher is mean and nasty and doesn't love people because he gets a little loud when he's preaching. But that's not the truth. The truth is, you can be kind and gentle and still stand your ground. And just because you're trying to get a point across doesn't mean you don't like somebody or you don't love them. And so sometimes we get falsely accused because we stand against sin. And we ought to stand against sin. We just don't need to be mean and nasty about it. God invites men to reason together. Look at Isaiah 118. Watch how God tells us to do this. God says in Isaiah 118, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. See what the Lord says is, He says to the sinner, the Lord says to the sinner, and this is the way we need to be, the Lord says to the sinner, Hey, I love you. Now come and sit down with me and let's reason together. The Lord says, let's just reason together. And that's the way God's people need to be. When we talk to people about, about sin and we talk to people about uh, the judgment to come and we talk to people about salvation, we need to sit down and reason with them, not debate and argue and fuss. Amen? So the only way to keep a discussion from becoming strifeful is to listen carefully. When we're talking to somebody about the Lord, and most of the time people that are not saved really don't know anything about the Bible. I see debates on the Internet all the time, and I see, I see debates between people who are Christians that obviously know the Bible and somebody else that's obviously not saved, but they've read in the Bible before, and they think they understand it, and they don't know anything about it. They've completely misunderstood it, and they accuse the Christian of not knowing the Bible when it's they themselves that don't know what it's, 
what it teaches. And so the Bible says we're to reason together. And so when it comes to talking to a, a lost sinner about the Lord, uh, the best thing for us to do is to listen to what they have to say so that we let them know that we respect them enough to listen and hear them out, hear their questions. If they got legitimate questions, we listen carefully. And when we listen carefully, they believe that then we care for them. And then they'll hear us out. But maybe you've been tempted like I have before. I've been talking to people about the Lord, you know, trying to, trying to show them how to be saved, and, and uh, they would begin to tell me what they thought needs to happen for somebody to get saved. And I knew they were wrong. They were totally off base according to the Bible. They didn't know what the Bible taught, and I knew that. And I, but inside, since I knew the truth and I knew they were unscriptural and what they believed, what I really wanted to do inside, something inside me, I think is the devil, inside me wanted to say just be quiet and I'll tell you the truth you just listen and let me tell you <laughs> that's what I felt like saying but when we come across that way even though we know the truth and they don't they're probably not going to care to hear it from us <laughs> because we come across as being know it all disrespectful not caring enough about them to even let them talk and so over the years I've tried to work on it where I keep my mouth shut and listen to hear what they've got to say because it matters and we can see into their heart better if we listen to what they have to say we can see where they're coming from and then we'll know the, know the right scriptures to go to to show them the answers to the questions they have another temptation is that sometimes we want to put words in their mouth and uh, we don't want to do this when you're trying to win somebody to the Lord if they really don't understand for instance Nobody can get saved unless they understand the concept of the sacrificial death of Christ. See, this is what, <coughs> here's what, <coughs> here's what salvation is built on. The substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I would go to hell if I tried to earn my way to heaven because I'm not good enough to get there. Neither are you. The Bible says we're all sinners. And nobody can get there by good works. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of good works, lest any man should boast. And so the primary concept of Christianity is that we have to be able to explain to the lost person that Jesus died on the cross for a purpose. And that purpose was to pay for our sins that we are incapable of paying for. And so if they, if they can understand that, they can get saved. If they can't understand that, they can't get saved. And so there's been times when I was telling somebody how to be saved, and I'd say, what do you think a person would have to do to go to heaven? And in, invariably, usually what lost people will say is the same thing I would have said before I got saved. I said, what do you think you have to go to, do to go to heaven? well I've got to be good and I've got to go to church and I've got to give money to the poor and I've got to do this, I've got to read my Bible, I've got to pray. I start naming off all these things I've got to do. That's the way most lost people do. They think you've got to do all these things in order to earn your way to heaven but you can't earn your way to heaven and we know that. And so I'd ask them that and I want to put words in their mouth and, and tell them, you know, believe that Jesus died in your place and I want to put the words there and speak for them. We can't do that. We have to explain and teach, but we can't put words in their mouth for them. They have to believe it in their own heart. We can't do that. But we can be respectful and listen to them and not get into a debate. Now, the Lord usually, if you can't, listen here, if you can't get very far without it turning into a strife or a debate, the best thing to do, the best thing to do is if it's turning into a strife or a debate, the best thing to do is to kindly and gently end the discussion and let the Lord use whatever has been said from the scriptures to work on them at a later time. You know, it's, uh, people have all kinds of unscriptural notions in their mind. And if they've got some, if they've got some roadblocks up there, uh, and if they're not ready to overcome them, if they're not ready to listen, if they're not ready to be taught and not ready to change their mind, if they're not ready to repent, then 
debating and arguing with them is not going to help anything. I mean, you've got to let them come to the place where they're ready to, uh, to learn the truth on their own. If they've got an imaginary thing going on up here that you can't overcome, it's best to just end the debate and go on. I mean, it's kind of like the two, two, two older ladies were talking and they were visiting together and, and uh, Miss Gertie says to Velda, she says, uh, boy, my cat can really play checkers. <laughs> and Velda says, is that right? Well, you must have a really smart cat. Gertie said, well, I don't know if I'd say that or not. I beat her three out of four games every time we play. Some of you didn't get it. <laughs> well, you will later. <laughs> if somebody is living in a world of imagination and that is their reality and they're not, they're not seeing what you're saying from the Scripture, it's best instead of debating just to end it and come back another day. Well, let me give you number three. Number three, teach and instruct with God's Word. We're learning that in this passage. Are you with me? In 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, Gentleness and patience is, and, uh, and a good Christian testimony is not enough, are not enough to win somebody to the Lord. In the Bible, we don't see such a thing as lifestyle evangelism. There are those who tell us that, well, I'm just going to live a good, clean life. I'm going to live a good, moral life. I'm just going to be such a nice and kind and gentle person that people will see Jesus in me and they'll get saved. Well, we ought to live a good gentle and kind life. We just got through saying that, didn't we, in the other scriptures. But that's not enough by itself. We have to take the words of the gospel and give to them in order for them to have the information they need to get saved. Just being kind and gentle and providing a good example, which we need to be, I mean, if we're living like the devil, nobody's going to want to hear our message anyway, right? <laughs> and so we need to have a lifestyle that boosts up the, the testimony, the words that we say, but we've got to say the words of the gospel because as we learned in earlier days in these lessons, the power of the gospel, the, the power of salvation lies in the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. And so gentleness by itself is not enough. Prayer is not enough. We have to tell the people how to be saved. Look at the scripture again, verses 24 and 25. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Now what's the next phrase? Apt to teach. So yes, we have to be gentle and kind in, in order to get somewhere with them, but then we have to teach. And look what else it says. Patient, yep, we've got to be patient. In meekness, doing what? Instructing. So instruction comes verbally. Instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So what are we saying on this point? We're saying that, that we've got to be gentle and patient and kind and good and try to be respectful to them, but still yet we have to pull out the Bible and show them what God says because it's not our kindness that's going to save them. It's not our patience and our goodness that's going to save them. That's just removing a roadblock so they can't object to our, our personality as we deliver the message. But the message of the gospel still must be delivered. And so when it comes right down to it, we have to tell them what the Bible says that the gospel is. Where is that found? Uh, it's defined, we went over it before, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first few verses. Remember, it's the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus. Salvation is not in living right, although we ought to live right. Salvation is in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He died in our place. Number four, down to the last point. Number four, only God can deliver someone who is in the snare of the devil. I can't trust my debating skills, my knowledge, my teaching ability, or my patience and humility. I must trust only the Lord and His Word and the Holy Spirit of God to bring deliverance to a lost soul. Verse 25 and 26, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if, see that little word there, if, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. We have to, look, we have to remember that we are fighting a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. 
It's not an intellectual battle. It's a spiritual battle that we're in. The Bible says, look at it again, what it says. It says, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. So people de debate in their own soul and try to keep from getting saved oftentimes. I know I did before I got saved. I was standing in the church service right over there about in a section, not in this church house, a different church house, but I was over there where Jimmy and Brenda are sitting and Sunday morning the preacher preached about being saved. And man, it's like a, like a debate going on in my head. Devil saying, don't get saved. The Lord saying, get saved. The devil saying, don't get saved. The Lord saying, get saved. And, uh, and I'm standing there during the invitation time and, uh, and the Lord saying, Rick, you promised me you would get saved. And uh, now's the day. And all of this is going on in my head. It's not voices out loud, you know. <laughs> and so uh, then I almost want to go forward and be saved and get it settled. So I know I'm going to heaven. And then the devil says, look, Rick, you're young. You can wait. You don't have to get saved now. You can have fun. You can live it up. You can drink and party and do all this stuff. You can live it up for a few years. You can always get saved when you get too old to do that stuff. <laughs> and you have the best of both worlds. That's what the devil's telling me. And the Lord said, no, if you don't get saved today, you may not ever have another chance. And so I said, okay, Lord. And that debate's going on. So we, we oppose ourselves before we're saved. And then look what else it says in verse 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Lost people are caught in the snare. What's a snare? It's a trap. Like I was trying to trap that little chicken I was telling you about last night that flew the coop. I'm trying to trap that little chicken and I grab at that chicken and boy, it flies away. It's gone. It thinks I'm the enemy. And... Uh, and the devil is trying to keep you in a snare when you're lost. And, and uh, when you got saved, you escaped the snare of the devil. And people who are still lost are in the snare of the devil. This is a, this is a spiritual battle. It's a battle going on behind the scenes that we cannot see. And the devil is trying to keep a grip on the lost person. He doesn't want to let go. And so we're fighting a spiritual battle trying to Get the gospel to them. And no matter how it appears, no matter how impossible the situation looks, it's still God that gives the repentance. Look at what it says there. And that they, uh, wait, if per, per adventure, if God per adventure, what does per adventure mean? I mean, perhaps, that maybe, God will give them repentance. So where does repentance come from? It comes from God. But wait, look at, the next, look at the next verse. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Repentance, this, you have to think with me just a minute here, okay? Got to really concentrate on this. Repentance is that change that comes in the heart and God has to grant it, but it's also at our disposal that we have to implement it. It's kind of like God gives you a tool to use and that tool is repentance a tool won't do anything by itself I can uh, I can hand I can hand Marcus a skill saw and and uh, and a board and tell him I need a board cut half and two and I can hand him the the skill saw but if he never pulls the trigger on that skill saw that board's not gonna get cut and it's that way with repentance God gives us repentance but we got to pull the trigger it's up to us to utilize the repentance that he grants us. Repentance is that change of mind that leads to a change in action. Repentance is when we turn our back on sin and turn to the Lord Jesus. And God has to give it, but we've got to do something with it when he gives it to us. And it's up to them, it's up to God to give the repentance, and it's up to us to use it at the time of salvation. Acts 17.30 says... And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I'll close with this illustration. <coughs> Our family, my wife and I and Aaron and Erica and my sister went up to uh, the cemetery where my dad is buried up in Izzard County on Monday. And I visited my dad's grave, put some flowers on the grave. And, and I just meandered uh, through the cemetery, the whole family just kind of walking around and looking at different graves and this is at Reeves Cemetery and uh, this is in the community of Gid where I grew up I knew I knew I either knew the 
and there's hundreds of graves out there and I either knew the people on the tombstones or knew their families of the great majority of them I knew them and some of them are young some of them are old some of them are middle aged and I was just looking at the names and the script inscriptions on the tombstones and I I came to the tombstone of a man by the name of Estes Jones Estes Jones was an old pretty old man when I first got saved in 1980 I went to Estes Jones house a number of times on visitation and took a took a, a Bible, a little New Testament with me and usually have a soul winning partner and I went to Estes' house. He was a, Estes Jones was a kind and gentle old man. He was the kind of fellow that just a good neighbor, didn't bother anybody. He was honest, just a good man as men go. But he was lost. He'd never been saved. And I'd go and sit down with Estes and he was just as nice and kind to me. He'd invite me in every time. And we'd talk about fishing or hunting and the neighbors and stuff for a while. And, and then I'd say, well, Estes, you know why I've come. I come talk to you about the Lord. He'd say, I know. I know why you came, preacher. I said, can I, can I share some scriptures with you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's all right. And so I'd read some scriptures and I'd tell him how every man was born lost how every man has to be saved or else he'll go to hell. And I'd explain to him how we're all sinners. And Estes never could grasp that. He, he would tell me, I'd ask him, I'd say, Estes, do you believe you'll go to heaven? Well, I think I will. I said, Estes, you told me you'd never gotten saved. Well, no, but I'm not a bad person. I paid my taxes. I had never hurt anybody. I'm honest good citizen Estes would tell me that every time but he would never trust the Lord Jesus as his savior I saw Estes' tombstone there Monday and as far as I know Estes Jones never asked the Lord to save him as far as I know and I was saddened when I looked at his tombstone I thought oh I was trying to remember how many times did I tell him how to be saved never would respond and I was really sad I looked at other tombstones of people that I'd witnessed to I've told you the story about Cuss and Reed his grave is there too Cuss and Reed never would trust Christ he meant to he was going to get saved the next week but he died of a heart attack before he got saved and then I came to the tomb of Von D. Reeves Von D., the reason I remember Von D., I, well, I'd known him all my life. His daughter was a girlfriend of mine in early early days. And, uh, well, I'm glad I didn't marry her. She turned out to be a loony. <laughs> I looked. Oh, she's, she's all right. I'm just, she might be watching. I better say she's all right. <laughs> um, that was her daddy's grave. I saw her daddy's grave, Von D. I remember Von D., the first the first person, one of the first people, probably not the very first, but he was among one of the first five or six people that I ever witnessed to after I got saved and tried to show him how to be saved. Von D. was very kind and uh, listened to everything, listened to every verse I read him. I told him how to be saved, but, but he, uh, he didn't receive the Lord. I went to see him a couple of times that way, and I was afraid of him. I was afraid he'd be mad at me. But he wasn't. He was always real kind. But he didn't get saved. But as I looked at his gravestone, I was not sad. You know why? Because Brother Sneathern that preached for us here a few weeks ago, Brother Sneathern was his pastor. And Brother Sneathern told me not very long ago, he said, you know Von D. Reeves that you witnessed to so many times? I said, yeah. He said he came to church one Sunday before he died. He said he came to church one Sunday and he said, uh, I'm shaking hands uh, with people as they were going out and he said Von D uh, shook my hand looked me square in the eye Brother Marcus he said he looked me right in the eye and said preacher he said you've told me that I need to take care of my salvation a lot of times and so have several others and he said uh, I think I need to take care of it today <laughs> Brother Sneathan said well when do you want to do it he said well 
He said, I'd like for you to come over to the house if you would. He said, I'm going to get saved. He said, I'll be over there just quick as I get the church house locked up. He locked up and went over there and sat down in Von D's living room and led him in a sinner's prayer and he got saved that night. And when I looked at Von D's tombstone, I was happy because he got saved. Can't say the same for some of those other tombstones. People have to repent. People have to come to the place where they're ready to be saved. If we don't debate and argue and strive with people, it might be. I don't know how much effect that I had on Von D. Reeves getting saved. There were some other tombstones there for some men that I'd witnessed to, and they got saved. Uh, Roy, uh, what's his name? I can't remember his last name. I, I remember his face, Roy. I, he was the first fellow I ever led to the Lord. His grave is there. I don't know how much effect I had on those other guys, but I know I planted some seed. We've established that this is the gospel seed, and they got saved eventually. And so if I'd have gotten mad and argued and showed, uh, showed out and fussed and ranted and raved at them, they might not have ever got saved. I'm glad some of those guys did. And I'm just saying, as we deal with people about getting saved, it's best not to strive, but be gentle. Give them the message. It's not a, in us. God has to be the one to do the saving. But if we deliver the message of salvation that Jesus died for their sins, some of the people will get saved. And that's what you and I are supposed to be doing. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless in the invitation time. Lord, I pray that, that you'd help us to make decisions that we would be faithful witnesses. Lord, we may not, be, we may not feel com confident. We may not feel competent. But Lord, I pray you'd give us the desire to try to win people to Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd bless us. Lord, I pray for the people who may be watching by way of the internet and for any folks in this room that might not be saved tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'd give them repentance tonight. Help them to have the faith just to ask you to save them. I pray that you'd bless now in the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.